The Special Fathers Network is thrilled to be sponsored by Rubin Law, a multi-generational law firm dedicated exclusively to serving families raising children with special needs. It's not one thing they do. It's the only thing they do. To find out more, go to RubinLaw.com, R-U-B-I-N Law.com, or call 847-279-7999 and mention the Special Fathers Network for a free consultation. 847-279-7999, Rubin Law. That's a joy. And likewise, when you have the opportunity, like I had with my brother, you know, he had a good attitude. He was a faithful man. You know, he was, you know, spirituality and religion were important to him. I don't think he could have survived as long as he did without uh, without having that faith. I, I, I truly believe, you know, was he ever upset or despondent? Yeah, but you get over it. He had a good attitude. That's David Hirsch's guest this week, Bill Danko, a father of three and a New York Times bestselling author. Bill had a brother, Tony, who had MS and sadly died in 2015 at age 68. But through faith and an incredibly upbeat attitude, Bill keeps keeping on. And we'll hear his story on this Special Fathers Network Dad to Dad podcast. Here's David Hirsch. Hi, and thanks for listening to the Dad to Dad podcast, Fathers Mentoring Fathers of Children with Special Needs, presented by the Special Fathers Network. The Special Fathers Network is a dad to dad mentoring program for fathers raising children with special needs. Through our personalized matching process, new fathers with special needs children connect with mentor fathers in a similar situation. It's a great way for dads to support dads. To find out more, go to 21stCenturyDads.org. And if you're a dad looking for help or would like to offer help, we'd be honored to have you join our closed Facebook group. Please go to Facebook.com groups and search Dad to Dad. And now let's hear this conversation between Bill Danko and David Hirsch. I'm thrilled to be talking today with Dr. William Danko of Niskayuna, New York, who's the father of three, grandfather of five, a retired professor from State University of New York at Albany, and a New York Times bestselling co author of the 1996 book, The Millionaire Next Door, and more recently, Richer Than a Millionaire A Pathway to True Prosperity. Bill, thank you for taking the time to do a podcast interview for the Special Fathers Network. Well, thanks for inviting me. You and your wife, Connie, have been married for 46 years and the proud parents of three adult children and five grandchildren. You are also the brother to Tony, one of your older brothers, who was incapacitated at age 23 by multiple sclerosis and died in 2015 at age 68. Let's start with some background. Where did you grow up? Tell me something about your family. Okay. Well, I've always lived in upstate New York and had a good public school education. Before that, thinking about college, my prospects were limited in a sense because I, my dad died when I was five years old. He was 38, and my mother didn't drive. And, and in fact, there were some relatives that lived two counties away from me in upstate New York that I never knew existed <laughs> until about five years ago when uh, a graduate student at the university said to me, you know, I think we might be related. And I said, Jeez, I'm right. <laughs> and so I asked her, okay, who is Blaze Danko? And she said, without missing a beat, that's my great grandfather. <laughs> okay. And it, <laughs> we went on from there. So it was very limiting in terms of, uh, my sphere was, you know, growing up in this uh, you know, small town in upstate New York. When I was ready to apply to colleges, I applied to Siena, the University at Albany, and Harvard. I still have my rejection letter from Harvard. It's very, very nice. <laughs> they let you down nicely. <laughs> but I got into Siena and the uh, State University. So I went to the university at Albany just because of the economics of it. As it turned out, it was a, a very good choice. I got a good education, met some good professors, and, and it really spurred on my career and my interest in education. Excellent. I'd like to go back a little bit. Uh, 
from what I remember, you're the fourth of four children. Your um, dad was a World War II uh, Navy veteran. And what did he do for a living? He, um, well, his education was limited to uh, 10th grade, but he had a heart of gold and he was directed, you know, he did the right thing in World War II by signing up, even though he had his first child already. Patriotism was alive and well, and he served in the Navy and the Asian theater, uh, the South China Sea specifically, and did what was right to defend the flag and our freedoms. So, I mean, I, I really look at that as a, a, a character. I mean, even though he died when I was five, it, it was certainly something when I look back at the historical records, you know, he served with honor. And then when he came back, he worked with uh, a GE and, um, well, he wore a necktie. So it wasn't a really blue collar because, <laughs> you know, the pictures I see of him at, uh, in the GE photos, he's wearing a necktie and a suit. So that's, uh, that says something, I think. Okay. But, but he worked with his hands. He, he designed uh, machine tools. It was a very good skill that he uh, acquired maybe through his Navy years. And it just goes to show you don't need a college education to uh, be productive. <laughs> that's lesson number one. Yeah, well, I'm um, sorry to hear that he passed away at such an early age and uh, when you were only five. Was it uh, multiple sclerosis? Is that what it was? It was. And and when I look back, you know, in the research of MS and how they were treating it at the time, heavy doses of steroids, steroids to alle alleviate the MS, but it was the steroids that probably contributed to his uh, ultimate demise. Do you have much of a memory of your dad or not really? Uh, no, I really don't. Um, it's, uh, in fact, the only memories I have are of you know, him standing on forearm crutches. You know, it's, it, there wasn't a lot of interaction in that sense. Uh, you know, not playing baseball or throwing a football around. You know, he just couldn't. Sorry to hear that. And I can only imagine what it was like to be your mom. Uh, with four kids and uh, your dad in a declining situation at such an early age. Uh, what a burden that seems like it would have been. Yeah. And yeah, my mom, you know, who just died uh, in 1998 at the age of 84, you know, she was a high school graduate. You didn't have a lot of, uh, you know, technical skills and, but she didn't spend a lot of money either. But what she did have was love for her family. And that's, Perhaps one of the best uh, things she can pass down, I think. Yeah, well, two important characteristics, you know, one from your dad about being a patriot and doing the right thing, and then um, the love. And I think when I think about a mother's love, I think about it's probably as close as we'll ever experience unconditional love. I think so. You know, and my mother, you know, even took care of her mother and her declining uh days and years well, seems like forever <laughs> but uh she she really um put her heart out there and got the job done so let's uh, segue to uh, special needs uh first on a personal level we've made reference to your brother tony who was diagnosed at his age 21 I'm going to guess about your age, 16. Did you have any experience uh, with special needs prior to learning about your brother's diagnosis? Uh, well, again, just witnessing the, uh, the deterioration in the health of my grandmother and the brief encounter with my father, you know, <laughs> you know that um, song, uh, Hush Little Baby, Don't You Cry? You know, the real version of that the first verse says, hush, little baby, don't you cry. Don't you know your mama was born to die? I mean, that, it sounds pretty stark, doesn't it? <laughs> that sounds frightening, yeah. Yeah. You know, we grow up with these sanitized versions of what a nice little uh, nursery rhyme. But um, I, I, again, I have to go back to my father. You know, that was the very first funeral I went to. And I guess when I was five, that's when I realized that I don't know if I called it mortality, but I certainly realize that we're all on the same path and we have a one-way ticket. And I got it when I was, you know, 
understood or began to understand at the age of five. I know a lot of people who have uh, come and gone through my life, and I'm saddened by it, but also I can't lament it. It's We just got to do what we can to make life filled with dignity as much as possible. So um, I'm wondering, um, when your brother was diagnosed, uh, what was your reaction? What was the family's reaction to all that? Well, initially, it's, you know, there are various uh, strains, if you will, of MS. And um, some other folks that I know in the community have what is called the intermittent strain. And most of the times uh, they have good days and sometimes they have bad days. But the point is, with I, I don't know if this is actually the technical term what my brother had, but it was a ratcheting down, and I think it was called chronic progressive MS. So it never got better, you know. If if he lost uh, sense in his fingers, uh, they never got better. Then it goes to his hands, and then it contractions to. You know, you, you would say, "Come on, can you just pull my arm down?" <laughs> And just straighten it out. I said, geez, I don't want to break it. And you can break it, but you got to be gentle. Basically, he was a, 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 by the time I got him, so to speak, as primary care uh, responsibility in 1996, I mean, I had to feed him, bathe him, dress him, make sure he got the right medical care and kept him out of a nursing home. And you know, and, and that's one of the good things about being an academic, I suppose. You know, you make your own schedule. You don't want to abuse it by any means, but uh, you have some flexibility in terms of uh, when an aide doesn't show up. Guess who's the aide du jour? <laughs> uh, moi. Right. But every Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, I was the personal aide, and that's uh, that was quite an experience, and it, it was good. It was good. Wish I, I wish I could do it again. <laughs> Really, it's uh, miss them. Yeah, that's pretty powerful. Uh, was there any meaningful advice that you got uh, that helped you put all this in perspective? It's again not lost on me that your dad died of MS. Your brother was diagnosed with MS. I don't know anything can prepare you other than love. Really, that's I think the only thing that will prepare you when you say I have to get it done. I will get it done. You know, and you can make it fun. I mean, fun, if you will. You know, I used to drive a Mercedes. Pretty cool. I traded it in for a wheelchair van. And uh, Honda Odyssey. Then you, you buy the new car. Then it goes to a chop shop in Michigan. And they you know, lower the floor and rearrange some uh, wires. And you get it back and... You get great parking spots, <laughs> but but it was absolutely incredibly important, you know? Yeah, well, uh, thanks for uh, emphasizing that, uh, the used Mercedes to the uh, <laughs> uh, wheelchair uh, adapted van. Yeah. It's a very vivid image in my mind. So I'm sort of curious to know what impact Tony's situation has had on his other siblings, your brothers and sister, as well as the rest of your family. Well, you know, you, you, you got to be realistic. My my oldest brother, who is uh, 11 years older than I, he lives uh, 250 miles away. I mean, it's, it's it just wasn't practical to say, hey, come on, you got to come here every weekend or every other day. That just wasn't going to work. And my sister, um, you know, was happily married and you know lived mostly in Florida. <laughs> that wasn't going to work either. That's even further away. And uh, and boy, and my sister, geez, just it was last October. She and her husband died in a car crash. It was just uh, trying to avoid a deer, hit a tree. She died instantly. My brother-in-law died a week later. Man, talk about a sudden impact. They were getting ready to go down to Florida. Hey, life goes on now, right? It seems like there's been a revolving door of loss in your family from a very early age and then throughout. 
and uh, very poignant. Um, thank you. But you know, none of us will escape it now. <laughs> that's it. Oh, yeah. There's very few absolutes in life, but that's one of them. Yeah. And you know what? <laughs> I, I have a, a goddaughter in Los Angeles who's a funeral director. And uh, she, uh, yes, in a private moment, will say she puts the fun in funerals. <laughs> okay. <laughs> No, but she takes the job very seriously. I told her she could take care of my uh, details when the time comes, and she said she would. Well, um, you have an interesting perspective on things, and uh, <laughs> it's pretty clear to me that you're a glass-half-full type of person. And I think part of that has to do with the battle test that you've been subject to at starting at a young age. Yeah, because, you know – Having taught almost 10,000 students at the university, you hear all sorts of comments and questions and like complaints about, oh, this is too hard. And I remind them, you know what hard is? Hard is digging a ditch in a rainstorm. That's hard. <laughs> what we're doing at the university is having fun exploring ideas. And as long as you look at your vocation of whether it be the research and it's fun doing the reading and the – well, not so fun doing the writing, but when it's done, it's fun. <laughs> um, you know, that's, that's a joy. And likewise, when you have the opportunity, like I had with my brother, you know, he had a good attitude. He was a faithful man. You know, he was – you know, spirituality and religion were important to him. I don't think he could have survived as long as he did without uh, – <laughs> Without having that faith, I, I I truly believe, you know, was he ever upset or despondent? Yeah, but you get over it. You know, it's he had a good attitude. Yeah, well, it sounds like uh, his attitude um, is infectious, right? Because if you see somebody in a situation like you've described with your brother and they're positive and upbeat, it's hard to feel sorry for yourself, right? It's hard to have a pity party for yourself when you know somebody else is you know what they wouldn't give to trade places with you exactly because there's somebody always worse off than you so i'm sort of curious to know if there's any supporting organizations that you or your family relied on uh, for tony you know, not in the secular sense, but but I really have to say the Catholic Church was uh, incredibly important. And again, even with having the van was important. Uh, there really was no excuse in, uh, you know, getting to Mass. <laughs> and uh, we did it. Yeah, that's the, the, the best support group. Well, thanks for sharing. So, uh Let's uh, switch gears and uh, talk about uh, the books you've written. And uh, the first, I think, is the seminal book that you had uh, partnered with uh, Dr. Thomas Stanley. And from what I remember, he was also at University of New York at Albany at the time that you were collaborators. Was he a mentor to you because he was a little bit older, or what was your relationship with him? Yeah, it was a consumer behavior class in 1973 that I got an A in, <laughs> but he liked my uh, attitude about you know how I approach problems, and he invited me to take part in his very first study of the affluent market. So it all started then in 1973. He encouraged me to get my MBA under his direction at, at the same university, and then right after that was completed – he went on to go teach at um, Georgia State University. Then I went to RPI to do a PhD program at the uh, Lally School of Management. But then in 1993, even though we had done from 73 to 93 a number of academic uh, articles and some consulting studies, in 1993, he called me up and said, look, I got this idea called Big Hat No Cattle. <laughs> And I said, gee, well, what are you driving at? He goes, it's about people who look like they have money, but don't. Okay, this was intriguing, you know, because you have a nice hook here uh, about who the pseudo-affluent are. So we did some more uh, 
survey research, a nationwide survey. I did the computer analysis on it. And in 1996, the book was published and it's been a runaway bestseller and still still selling, still, still getting royalties. I love the backstory. Thank you for sharing. One of the most important takeaways for me when I was reading, rereading uh, the book, The Millionaire Next Door, were that there's seven factors that you and Tom had outlined. We could go into all of these and have a robust conversation. But the one that really struck me, and maybe it's because I'm the father of five now adult children, and you know we're sort of at that uh, point as they're leaving the nest and starting lives of their own, um, trying to figure out, well, what role, if any, do we want to play from an economic standpoint? And I'd like to drill down on this, Bill, because I think it's super important. Mm-hmm. And I'd like you to uh, share with us what it was that you and Tom were focused on, on this economic outpatient care. Yeah. You know, the wisdom of Warren Buffett comes into play. He famously said, give your children enough so that they can do anything, but not so much they can do nothing. You know, well, what is the best gift you can give the next generation? Well, how about a good education? How about good health care? Things that are, uh, I don't want to say intangible, but things that are really lasting. You know, you're grateful. I know my own children are, are grateful for the fact that, you know, their undergraduate degrees, you know, were largely subsidized by mom and dad. And they're grateful because they have a lot of their friends who are in debt still. So, Parent EOC is really economic outpatient care, I think, is really about good parenting. Yeah, well, it's uh, easy to talk about. I think it's more challenging to draw the line. You know, uh, at what point do you stop paying their insurance, their cell phone bills, underwriting their vehicles and things like that? And, uh, you know, not all parents are on the same page, right? And one of the things I always fall back on is that you know, we shouldn't do for our kids what they could do for themselves and give them an opportunity to do it on their own, right? Because I've seen way too often, not only from a personal perspective, family-wise, but from a professional perspective, when mom and dad are always just quick to pick their kids up and don't want them to to experience any failure. Um, And I think that that's how we become more resilient. That's how we become more self-sufficient is to have to do things on our own and figure it out. And I think that's the message I took away from the uh, concept of this economic outpatient. Yeah. I, I did a presentation a uh, number of years ago on the West Coast. Um, it was parents who were software engineers and their children were in the same luncheon session. And the emphasis was about economic outpatient care. I can tell you the parents loved the presentation and the kids hated me. <laughs> but it's called tough love, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, and it's just, uh, you know, making them physically responsible, right? Helping them, be- not making them, helping them become physically responsible. Again, Millionaire Next Door came out in 1996 and it's still selling. But, you know, that pivotal period, you know, when I had the primary responsibility for my brother through 2015 until he died, really made me not question, but really think about what is really valuable in life. And that really became the uh, the inspiration for uh, the next book, Richer Than a Millionaire. That, you know, in that book, it reiterates and reinforces the same concepts in The Millionaire Next Door, but it takes on another aspect inspired by Benjamin Franklin when he said, you know, do not depend so much on your prudence and frugality and industriousness, excellent things they are, because it can all be blasted without the blessing of heaven. (laughs) And therefore, we must always be charitable to those around us because there's always those in need. And when you think about that wisdom from more than 250 years ago, I mean, it's it's classic. I mean, but look, in Christianity, we have Matthew 25, don't we? You know, that which you've done to the least of these, you've done unto me. You know, one of the pillars of Islam is uh, almsgiving, being charitable. 
Judaism. I mean, it's big on philanthropy. I, and, the, and I think it's uh, Isaiah 58 that talks about very much the same things that are in uh, Matthew 25 in the New Testament. It seems like a universal idea that we have an obligation to help others. N- not the government helping, but people helping people on a one-on-one basis. I really think that's uh, not only wired into the religions, but also you know, when you think about what Benjamin Franklin said, well, that became really a, an important part of Richer Than a Millionaire because we demonstrate that you can have um, great wealth and score very low on the so-called happiness or subjective well-being score that's incorporated in the book. And there are other people who have modest wealth who score very well and high on this uh, subjective well-being. And so when just my, like we looked at the prodigious accumulators and the under-accumulators of wealth, we can do a contrast and compare of the well-adjusted versus the maladjusted. And the things that make the well-adjusted so well-adjusted are truly, they're God-centered, they believe in the golden rule of doing unto others as you would have them do unto you. They're at peace with their soul. I mean, that inner peace, I mean, that is so valuable. We live in a stressful world, and if people can just understand the things they have in their life are valuable, then they don't need other external things. You know, be happy with what you have is is really the message in Richer Than a Millionaire. Because money, yeah, look, money buys good health care. Money buys good cars, good neighborhoods. But what about the inner peace? Yeah, well, you're touching on a really important issue. And um, I'd like to reflect on the book, which came out in 2017, so just a few years ago now. And it wasn't lost on me that you dedicated the book to Tony, your brother. And there was a quote in the front of the book that said, in all ways spiritual, Tony was far richer than a millionaire. Yeah. I thought that was really touching. Thank you. In fact, uh, my co-author, Rich Van Ness, uh, came up with that. Maybe his wife did. I don't know. <laughs> but he's the one who said, you know, we've got to dedicate this to Tony. And, uh, boy, and, and it just so happens that on the uh, – see, Tony died on a July 16th, June 15th. June 5th was his birthday. And it just so happens that my wife and I and were at the uh, the Van Ness household for a little barbecue. It happened to be Tony's birthday. They did not know that. But that happened to be the very last birthday he ever celebrated. And that's, boy, so it's, it's, it's touching. It's rich. <laughs> and uh, with gratitude, I'm uh, glad they suggested that particular dedication. And, you know, the more... I think about it, and the older I get, you know, it really comes down to, um, well, love your neighbor. It's as simple as that. Look at all the problems we would solve with loving our neighbor. Um, I'd like to switch gears and talk about the Milton and Mary M. Danko Golden Rule Awards Hmm. that... uh, were started in 2001 in memory of your parents. Mm-hmm. How did that come about? Yeah. One of my friends at the university, Sorrel Chesson, he was in university advancement. And uh, we went to lunch one day and I told him about this concept. I want to create a scholarship. And he said, well, what's important to you? I said, well, the most important thing to all of us is time. He goes, well, let's make it about time. And it's about students who give their most precious resource to others, volunteering their time for the greater good. And boy, there's a. It's on my uh, you know my personal web page at the university. The the whole list of uh, winners, but every single one of these winners, you know, from the year two thousand one to currently, I mean, like this year's winner is a volunteer fireman. 
And what really struck me on his essay about when he applied for this, he goes, I will go into burning buildings to save others. <laughs> you know, it's not that it's bad to make cupcakes for a school luncheon, <laughs> but he says, I will put my life on the line. And that really struck me because I know my father was also a volunteer fireman. And uh, it's uh, so it's, it's very fitting. So he gets to donate half the money of the scholarship and to uh, a worthy organization. And who did he pick? He picked his volunteer fire company, which is a bona fide charity or you know, 501c3 organization. And he gets the other half to uh, defray expenses at the university. So, yeah, it's um, when I look at my father's life of service, not only in the Navy, but also a volunteer fireman, and really never seeing him complain about anything he had to do. He had a sense of duty, I think. And then seeing my mother, how she took care of her mother, and well, took care of her husband too, for that matter, and then raised uh, her children, me being the baby, right? She, uh, man, that's, again, when people complain about how hard things are, I just don't want to hear it. Just do it. Yeah, well, I think it's a great testimony to your parents, and uh, I, I'm hoping that other people will be inspired to do something that would be befitting their family, whether it's their grandparents or their parents or, you know, even um, a friend, right, who has been an inspiration to them. And, uh, you know, it's not so much about the money. Right. These are $1,000 scholarships. They're not going to change the world individually, but what you're doing is that you're helping people focus, helping young people focus. And in this case, with students at New York University at Albany. Yeah, and we also have two of them at a Teal College in Western Pennsylvania, where my wife went to school. Uh, they're named after her parents and grandparents, uh, but it's the same basic format of uh, the givers of time. Yeah, I love it. Let's switch gears and uh, talk about advice. Um, I'm wondering if there's any advice that you might be able to offer someone, a sibling or a parent for that matter, as it relates to um, being there, being present. You know, I, I think parenting is crucial. I really do. Um, you know, I was fortunate to have some uncles uh, in my father's absence. But what happens when you have no family structure at all? Um, something is going to fill the void. Your, your friends, acquaintances, strangers. There's a lot of uh, dysfunction in society because of that breakdown on the family. And we're not doing a, a service when we look, even in our tax structure, I don't know if it's still true, the marriage tax, you know, you were better off being single than you were being married. I don't know if that's been fixed in the IRS code or not. I mean, I have a CPA who takes care of that. But there is a definite breakdown in the family. And boy, and we're getting to be an older population too. And who is going to take care of all the infirm people who don't have family structure? What are you going to do? Put them in a, a nursing home with strangers who just think of it as a job? You, you, you have to have somebody who has love and compassion to help those who can't help themselves. That's probably the best lesson I could give. I mean, look, again, money is important. You know, they say, you know, it's like oxygen. You kind of miss it if you don't have it, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, right. But um, one of the, the, the graphs in uh, Richer Than a Millionaire, we ask, um, what's your current net worth? Okay, that's a a known number. And then we asked the question, how much do you think you need in order to feel wealthy? And it's a curvilinear relationship. And the graph is in the book, but basically at around $5 million is it's where the curve bottoms out. Now, when we ask somebody, well, if you have 500,000 now, you think you need two and a half million. If you have two and a half million, you think you need five. If you have five, you think you need eight. So fortunately, it decays a little bit there. 
But when you realize that the median net worth in the United States per household is about $100,000. Now, if you're above 100000 you're doing better than average, right? If you have $1.5 million, you're already in the top 10% of the distribution. And then we can talk about, well, gee, is that real estate or is that in, in – are those liquid assets, you know, as, as, are you paying dividends? But my point is, when you get to that $5 million mark, that is plenty. It is plenty. But yet there are some who will say it's not enough. And they'll continue doing what they have to do to get more and more and more. Remember, there are no pockets and burial shrouds. <laughs> Never forget that. <laughs> You know, point well made. So I'm wondering if there's anything else you'd like to say before we wrap up. I want to say, look, it, it, this is really a, a, a wide ranging conversation we had. And I'm glad uh, you you uh, sought me out to uh, talk about not just the typical stuff on the research, but what it means to be a compassionate human being and caring for others. And, uh, and I, I hope it's a lesson that my children will embrace, I hope others will embrace. And through the scholarships, you know, I, I talk to each one of these winners and interview them. And, yeah, I know they have hearts of gold. So I know it's out there and we have to encourage more of it. It's as simple as that. That's fabulous. Bill, if somebody wants to learn more about your books, the Milton and Miriam Danko Golden Rule Awards, or to contact you, what's the best way to do that? Well, the uh, best email would be um, WDD9125 at gmail.com. That's also my post office box, 9125. <laughs> I also have a Google number that has 9125 for phone. <laughs> so everything is 9125. But WDD9125 at gmail.com will work. And about the richer than a millionaire, there's a, a number of interviews and articles that are it's, it's a well populated site, but it's uh, literally richer than a millionaire dot com, no spaces. And um, then I know if you Google uh, William Danko, you'll probably find out more things than I know about myself. <laughs> it's it's there's a lot of stuff out there, but but those two things, my email, I certainly, I, and I respond. To, uh, to serious inquiries, <laughs> of course. and But the uh, richerthanamillionaire.com will give uh, some of the best overview of career and about my colleague, Rich Van Ness, and what we hope to accomplish. Great. We'll be sure to include that in the show notes. Bill, thank you for taking the time and many insights. As a reminder, Bill is just one of the individuals who's part of the Special Fathers Network, a mentoring program for fathers raising a child with special needs. If you'd like to be a mentor father or are seeking advice from a mentor father with a similar situation to your own, please go to 21stCenturyDads.org. Thank you for listening to the latest episode of the Special Fathers Network Dad to Dad podcast. I hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as I did. As you probably know, the 21st Century Dads Foundation is a 501c3 not-for-profit organization, which means we need your help to keep our content free to all concerned. Would you please consider making a tax deductible donation? I would really appreciate your support. Would you also please share the podcast and post a review on iTunes to help us build our audience? Also remember to subscribe so you'll get a reminder when each new episode is produced. Bill, thanks again. Thank you. And thank you for listening to the Dad to Dad podcast presented by the Special Fathers Network. The Special Fathers Network is a dad to dad mentoring program for fathers raising children with special needs. Through our personalized matching process, new fathers with special needs children connect with mentor fathers in a similar situation. It's a great way for fathers to support fathers. Go to 21stCenturyDads.org. That's 21stCenturyDads.org. And if you're a dad looking for help or would like to offer help, we would be honored to have you join our closed Facebook group. Please go to Facebook.com groups and search Dad to Dad. Also, please be sure to register for the Special Fathers Network bi-weekly Zoom calls held on the first and third Tuesdays of every month. Lastly, we're always looking to share interesting stories. If you'd like to share your story or know of a compelling story, 
please send an email to david at 21stcenturydads.org. The Dad to Dad podcast was produced by Couch Audio for the Special Fathers Network. Thanks again to Ruben Law for supporting the Dad to Dad podcast. Call Ruben Law at 847-279-7999 and mention the Special Fathers Network for a free consultation. 847-279-7999.